Hey, it's Joel. Once a year, the 3D printing community gathers in Bel Air, Maryland for the East Coast Rep Rap Festival and shows off the latest and greatest of what's to come. We're going to take you inside and give you a peek. And we're going to do it right here on 3D Printing Nerd. Multi-material and multicolor printing, one of the futures of 3D printing that most people want to achieve. Bill here though, he took it his own way, didn't use a pallet, didn't use an MMU, and hacked himself something pretty awesome. Hey Bill. Hey Joe, how are you? How was that for an intro? That was awesome. <laughs> Talk about this right here because this is insane what you've done. So this is the 3D Chameleon. Um, it is a very simple, low-cost tool changer, color changer, um, filament changer, whatever you want to call it, right? For any printer. Any printer at all? Any printer, yeah. So the idea here is that we are no longer needing a modified firmware or hardware to support this. This literally will mount to pretty much any printer. So this is, this is just G-code powering this? It's G-code, yeah. So what we have here is a switch that is uh, literally switching the motors between left and right. <laughs> it's an actual hardware switch. It's a hardware switch, right? Um, we took it a step further on the four color where you can see here we have two switches. Okay, so so right up here it looks pretty complex. Is is it as complex as it looks? It's actually more complex than it looks. <laughs> so so uh, CBC and C um, a couple years ago developed their little Y adapter. Oh, I remember they, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Real nice design. Um, I took that design and uh, uh, A made it cheaper, but B made it better. Um, so did you so, tell Steve? I haven't told them yet. Okay. But I actually modified it to use standard PC ten four connectors here. Um, so it's much cheaper than their turn and machine parts. Uh, the other thing I did is you'll notice it's four colors. Four inputs, one output, right? I see that. And then there's a lot of other geometric changes inside of here to help us. We actually, uh, you know, Prusa MMU1, which this is based off of, if you think about it, um, they kind of abandoned that approach because they couldn't get the tip shaping quite right. Uh, so the last year I've actually spent actually researching and understanding what the actual issue is. And there, it actually breaks down into a couple issues. The PLA filament swells. Uh, we get a string in on the end that curls up, kind of jams on itself, or you'll get a blobbing in it. So I decided to tackle it by making it um, for, first fault tolerant to allow those features to exist and not jam it. Okay, that's okay. That's a great first step. Yep. And then the second thing is, is I also have a what I call the forging zone in here, where we actually hammer forge it before it's uh, transitioned to the solid. Wait, wait. By hammer forging, you mean you're you're forcing the filament through a smaller orifice yes. without adding energy. Exactly. Well, uh, you know, it's already cooling down, so we're just kind of slowing the rate of cooling to a controlled rate. Um, and then we, we move that back and forth in here very rapidly several times before we pull it into the tube once it's solidified fully, right? Um, and That's then, cool. And then there's a few other features in here that allow us to actually steer those strings correctly into the uh, nozzle so that they don't curl back up on themselves. So yeah, that's a, it's a lot of magic in this little piece. That little piece houses a lot of magic, you're right. But I mean, again, if you, if you look at the setup here, that one magical piece is just part of this amazing system. So you have four, four steppers up top, yep. and you've got these switches right here and yeah, here. Literally mechanical switches. So it's a binary tree. We have one power, one motor cable coming in from the extruder. They get split into left or right and each one of those gets split into a left or right switch, right? So it's literally, it's a binary tree, and, and the G-code, uh, tool change G-code, just selects which sequence of buttons to press. If I'm switching from one uh, to the other on this side, it's a left button. If I'm switching from this side to this side, it's a right button, right? And if I'm doing both, it's a left button and a right button, and it just taps one, it goes over and taps the other one, and then loads the filament. Meaning it's a mechanical switch for the power for the steppers. Yes, exactly. You're actually switching. So as far as the printer's concerned, it's just talking to one motor. That's right. But the G-code says by hitting these mechanical switches, the printer's actually talking to as many steppers as you want? Yeah, so you can actually stack these things up. Um, in this case, there's only four, so there's two switches. If you wanted eight, you would have another switch down under the Y-axis. The Y-axis would come and bump this and that would change it from the front four motors to the back four motors. Oh, so the x-axis is hitting the buttons right yeah, now. But you can also have the y-axis do that, you can have the z-axis do that. We're using secondary functions of the primary motors, right? When they're not normally doing their printing, they can do other things. 
You can even pair this up with direct drive or Bowden tube. Uh, direct drive, you've got many options. You can pull the direct drive, make it a Bowden tube. You can actually pair up the motors. Um, you can buy hours without the motors and use, say you want to use Prusa motors, go for it, right? You've got an old MMU1, guess what? I can get it working now. Bill, this is amazing. So people are going to be obviously really curious about this. Where can they go to find out more? So our website, 3dchameleon.com. Oh, you got the domain. Yeah, yeah. So $99 for the two color. Uh, basically, it's $99 for every two colors, right? So the four <laughs> colors, $199, you know, so. Yeah, and they're extensible. So you buy the two color, you can upgrade to the four. Well, I was going to say upgrading to four, it just needs a different piece and two more motors piece, mounted. And switches and motors, yep. <laughs> yep. Bill, I love talking to you, man. Thanks. There is no shortage of awesome at Earth, including this offering from Dyes Design. And I've got Phil. Hey, Phil. Hey, how are you? I'm awesome. And I mean, not as awesome as this, though. Can you talk about what I've got in front of me? Yeah, of course. So these are our industrial line of products, so extrusion head for big 3D printers. So these are the high flow volume that we've designed for about like one year and a half to two years. So we have a filament extruder over there that is called the Typhoon, and we have the pellet extruder over there that is called the Pulsar. So the Typhoon can handle about one kilogram per hour, and the Pulsar is able to do two kilogram per hour using pellets. So <laughs> That's insane! Yeah, that's a lot of plastic. So if you take a look at the, the drum you have over come on, there, come on. so that's an actual working drum we've, we've uh, built using the, yeah, it, it actually works. And you, you might want to try the 3D printed bass drum pedal we've got over there. Oh, is it printed? Yeah, it okay. is. Okay, ready, Sean? One of the things that appeals to me about this is that this could enrich the lives of kids in music programs where they might not be able to afford standard musical equipment. Yeah, that is true. So if you have a broken drum or something that it cannot be fixed by small gluing stuff, so you can do the exact same project as we have here, print the shell and bring it back to life. And a lot of people were skeptical about the sound of it, but actually I think the, the heads do most of the work and you still can get something that sounds pretty good, even though it's, it's 3D printed. What I like is, I would imagine, I mean, I'm not a musician, so I don't know, but, but the heads and all this hardware is reusable. So if someone had a broken drum set, they could take the hardware off get 3D printed shells and put it right back on? Yeah, exactly. So with a minimal, minimal cost, you can build it, bring it back to life using a 3D printer. It started out by buying a standard drum, remove all the hardware, take a few measurements, and then we print it from a vase mode. Like, for example, the base drum is a single line, nine millimeters thick by two millimeters. Wait, wait, nine millimeters wide. Yeah, yeah, it, it, was, a, it was not going that fast, but I mean, every, 15 minutes you were looking at it and it was one inch higher so the whole thing for example the bass drum is about five kilos so in terms of pellet it costs about 25 bucks in, in, in polymer to, to build and it took about five hours so as a drummer though 25 bucks for a bass drum that's not bad right no that's really good I mean the the, the wood shells would cost about a hundred bucks if you bought it from a standard maple uh, shell so there's definitely something cool about it, both in terms of price, but also also in terms of looks. Oh, it looks incredible. In fact, the, the rest of the drum heads are 3D printed as well. No, so the drum heads, it's some kind of a PET that is stretched out. So oh, it, okay. It's a very special uh, polymer. So only the shells for now are, uh, are printed. Well, maybe in the future though, you never know. Yeah, actually I'm working on a different kind of drum that use as much 3D printed parts as possible. So I'm trying to get rid of, of all these costly hardware that you need. So it will be like maybe in the next Earth uh, show. Well, that would be fantastic. And I mean, it's, it seems great that someone who's a drummer or someone who wants to get started in drumming, rather than going to a music store to buy all this stuff, they could in a weekend have themselves a drum set. Yeah, definitely. So it's fun to build it. It's fun to learn what, what changes the sound. So if you don't like something, you just scrap the shell, shred it, put it back in the pellet extruder and have a different shape, a different length or a different diameter printed for you. So one of the things though I want to talk about, um, this was made with a, an industrial machine. A yeah. business. So let's go back over here real quick because, yeah. because these are exciting but they come at a cost, isn't that right? Yeah, that's true. So 
we aim for the industrial industry, so all the design is not made to be affordable, it's more made to be reliable. So of course, like for example, the Typhoon is 2,500 and the pellet extruder is 8,000, 8, sorry. So that's, that's very costly, but what we explain to the people is that with, with the Pulsar, each kilogram you print kind of makes you save money. So at the end, if you're someone who prints a lot, who gets kind of contract with the uh, other people, it's something you can make money out of. Well, uh, something like this, for an industrial or business customer, over time, this will save them money. Exactly. Phil, this is awesome. I just want to shake your hand. Thank you so much. Thanks to you. It was a pleasure. Earth is the place to see a lot of incredible, new, wonderful machines. This is no exception. This is Kyle. Hey, Kyle. How you doing? Kyle has Elite Machine Works, and he first started with this machine, a refinement in the process to make something that was going to be the best at what it could do. And then we have this. You ready? This is the kit version. It's going to be for sale. Kyle, can we talk about it? We can, a little bit. Uh, February or March of next year, shooting for a price of 1800 to 2400 kit version. It'll come with everything you see here. Um, it's been all fully CNC machined on a commercial <laughs> industrial grade CNC machine. Uh, it goes together really easy and hoping to get these into a lot of hands of people. So, A lot of people would love this because the specs are beyond anything. Can you just talk about some of the upgrades or some of, some of what's on here that people can expect to see? Yeah, it's all overkill. Um, <laughs> It's 20 millimeter rods on the bed, 16 on the Z, and then dual genuine high wind on the X. And the carriage is fully <laughs> removable, so it's two Ethernet jacks on the carriage, four screws, and it comes off, so you can work on it on your bench and eat everything. Well, and I see that's a Bontech there, direct drive into a Mosquito. Is that right, or is that an E3D? No, that's, an that's an E3D. You have a Mosquito on the back end here. The kits will come with the E3D V6. And it's, that's probably the strongest magnetic bed on the market. <laughs> Can you demonstrate it? I embed all the magnets into the bed. I machine the pockets. And so the magnets are only half a millimeter from the surface of the bed. <laughs> and then I fill those pockets with thermally conductive epoxy. And then I machine <laughs> down the overflow after the epoxy has dried. So the, bed, the bottom of the bed is all nice and smooth and the magnets are permanent into the bed. And there's probably, I think it's 30 magnets in the bed. 30? Yeah. Well, you buy those other systems and they kind of peel up the sheets, so you don't have a problem with this. It's pretty, it's stout. Jeez, that was like, that was yeah. surprisingly loud. It's almost a safety hazard. Look at, and there's no play. There is no play whatsoever in that. Not even a slight wiggle. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's definitely overkill. What's your background? Uh, mechanical engineer. That makes sense. Industrial engineering. So I designed a, a printer that I thought would meet my needs. <laughs> Does it? It does, it does, I, it's great. This is exciting, and I, I love the just the sheer unabashed overkill that you put into this. Where can someone go to find out more information about this kit or how they might be able to acquire it? EliteMachineWorks.com right now. The website's pretty barren, but I'm working on updating it and getting the specs out there and everything. Well, you've been busy, obviously. Very busy with, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very busy with the design work and the machining and everything. That's, that's my expertise. Doing the website stuff and everything is not, it's an afterthought right now. But uh, I, I definitely enjoy this stuff, for sure. I can tell by the look and the quality you have here, Kyle. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joel. A big thanks again to Surfshark for sponsoring this episode. Surfshark is a privacy protection suite based on virtual private network architecture. And it's great while traveling, and here's why. I travel a lot, and I get to see the latest and greatest that 3D printing has to offer all over the globe. And because of that, I want to maintain my privacy even when abroad, and Surfshark allows that. It can keep you safe because it will hide your location from those who don't need to know it. It'll also keep you secure because hotel Wi-Fi networks are typically open and anyone can join. Plus, it can boost your mobile speed and quicken the connection by blocking ads from coming down to your device. I'm safe, I'm secure, and thanks to Surfshark, I've got no advertisements to distract me. It's time to get back to work. Give Surfshark a try with my exclusive limited time deal. Click on that link in the description or go to surfshark.deals forward slash 3D nerd and use my promo code 3D nerd to sign up for 83% off and get one extra month absolutely free. Last time you saw us together, we were assembling a Redbox 2 on stream 
and Pooch did a little electrical work in my garage. Hey, man. That's right. Hey, how's it going, man? It's going great, and the electrical work's still holding strong. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. You know, that red box, too, that comes in really handy to hold multiple filaments, but I've heard that there's this thing now. What is this? Yeah, yeah. So this is uh, an overhaul of the 3D printed rewinder that uh, Vincent, I'm forgetting his last name now, but uh, it's, a, it's <laughs> I should know that, Vincent online did, uh, it, it, which had a completely 3D printed rewinding mechanism with the intent that when you're using it with a Prusa, anybody that has used the MMU2 knows that one of the challenges perhaps with this is that when it changes colors, it has to retract a good amount of filament. And if you don't do something with that retraction, it can cause tangles and trying to backfeed the spool. Ah, right? uh, that makes sense. Right, so what Prusa did was they developed that buffer box, but a lot of people have complained that it's a little bit cumbersome to load and unload and deal with. And so the rewinder is a nice, elegant way to deal with, hey, just wind it back on the spool if it's not. Makes sense to me. Yeah, if you need it. So what I did is I, I looked at what Vincent had done and I said, this is good, but I think I'd do a little bit better. Um, I wanted to add metal, some metal parts for additional reliability. So most of it is 3D printable. All the files are available for, you know, for free for anybody on uh, prusaprinters.org. So you can download that today if you want. Um, I have kitted together the non 3D printable parts and we already sold through all of them. I bet, uh, dude, that's, be, that sounds like a great idea. They'll be available on the website. Um, and basically it consists of a couple springs on the inside and there's an adjustable clutch so you can control the tension, so how much it's pulling back and at what point it slips and whatnot. And then I added this little crank guy here. Uh, and what that allows you to do is uh, pre-tension the spring so you could either pre-tension it in here without having to kind of wind it first, or you can take an empty spool that you might have lying around, and now you have something to do with these awesome little uh, <laughs> samples you want where you just put it on there, let it wind it up for you. Onto an old, you got a reuse of an old spool, you got something to do with your filament here. So it sounds like a great solution though, because rather than having to buffer it, we have the spool handy. Why not just have it go back on the spool? Exactly, exactly. And the, the whole reason I did that was because it enables direct printing now from the rep box to the MMU2, so you don't need that extra space for the buffer and all that stuff. And you can see that working right here. You got a nice multi-material print from uh, both designs going. And uh, good choice. Couldn't be better. Yeah, and and uh, coming soon, this is the other thing I'm teasing. This is my mega MMU2 unit. So this is designed to bolt on. It's still five unit for now, but it bolts directly onto the front of the rep box uh, and the ports line up exactly. So this will be shared as well because it's it's developed exactly on Prusa's thing. And as far as the MK3 knows, it's it's the same unit. It just had to adjust the firmware to, to tell it where to index to a little further than the more compact original. So wait a minute, wait a minute. We're talking about taking this part right here yep. and attaching it to the rep box. You got it. And now we just have one filament going from this to the Mark III or, or Mark five. III S. One to five filaments, yeah. No, no, one meaning one filament one. because you no longer need this these Bowden tubes no, here. you're exactly right. You have the one Bowden tube. So it, it makes it nice and compact. You put that on the wall right above it. You feed just straight down into it and you're good to go. That's really cool. When can we expect to see that available? I'm really, I'm really shooting for end of the year on this one. Like uh, Christmas? I, I wanted, yes, maybe a Christmas gift to the community, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I, I wanted to have it ready for this, but it, it, I haven't tested it enough yet, so I want to make sure it's dialed in before I release it. But it will be released to the public. Uh, and really, if you have the MMU2, it's just a matter of printing the larger parts, and you uh, can use basically what you have here. There is uh, some longer shafts, so again, I'll kit that stuff for people that want to buy it from me. That's great. If you want to source it, I'll have a bomb available for people to do that. If people wanted more information about what you're offering, how can they find out? Repcord.com, everything's on there. Uh, links to all the downloadable files and any of the kits that you might need. Part of what makes 3D printing special is the models and sculpts you can recreate, but that's not the end of the story. You have to finish them as well, and not a lot of people can do it better than my friend Wally. Hey, Wally. Hey, Joel. How you doing, man? I'm great. This is an impressive display of artwork here, and it's smooth, it's shiny. Can can we talk about this a little bit? Sure, sure, I'd be glad to. Uh, there's a good mixture here of FDM and resin. Uh, obviously, the resin needs a lot less sanding, but still some. Right. But the FDM is the biggest, and I'll show you what I do here. So, you always have the layer lines. That's right. So, I take red spot putty from the auto shop. I thin it with acetone. Oh, it's... Thinning with acetone, okay, I see where you're going. So then you kind of have this slurry, but the acetone also makes it evaporate, because it evaporates so fast, uh, you get a really great finish. I brush it across the um, 
layer lines so it fills and it softens the top of the PLA just a touch. Oh, just, just a little bit. Just a touch. Just a little bit. And, and then I take my Walmart toothbrush. <laughs> I, I cut off the bristles. I cut a bunch of uh, art foam discs on my, on my Glowforge. Tiny as, little art foam discs. Yes, as well as various grits of adhesive back sandpaper. Uh, so then I just start sanding. And the, the edge of the tool allows me to get into uh, crevices and stuff. So the putty doesn't take away from the detail because I can bring most of it back with the sander. Oh, then man. after I've done this at least once, sometimes twice, I hit it with, uh, with my Badger primer and I come up with a, a, a pretty respectable finish. Oh, that's smooth, Wally. That's really smooth right there. I, I've, you know, it, it's, it's a process that's worked pretty well for me. Apparently. And is this then, at this smoothness, is that ready for paint? I'm ready to paint this, yep. So then what's the painting process for a model like this? Well, or like any of these here? I typically start with the Badger. I can't pronounce it's stylized or something like that. Uh, it's an acrylic uh, uh, primer. If I can airbrush, I airbrush as much as I can uh, with my base colors. Uh, and then I start doing my detail work. I would prefer to paint parts before I glue the body together. Okay. Because there's a huge benefit to that. Uh, this is a good example here of the Iron Man. Because he, the modeler chopped him at natural seams, I can paint all those parts individually so I don't have to mask, I don't have to tape. That saves uh, a lot of time, doesn't it? Oh man, are you? <laughs> yes, it does. So you paint them all up, and then once I'm happy with them, start gluing them together, and then just start painting it. Yeah, when you say just start painting it, I mean, if I were to do that, it would be it would be similar to a restaurant, you know, uh, coloring sheet with some crayons, and some of it might be outside the lines, right? You say just paint this, but these are showroom-ready models here, Wally. Well, but what you have here is the end of my process. <laughs> Not me bringing models that I made years ago that look like <laughs> they were painted at Denny's with crayons. <laughs> so uh, one of the pieces of advice that I always give people when they say something about it is you've got to enjoy your hobby. If you're not enjoying it, take a break and come back because if you just got to enjoy it. And you enjoy it, obviously. I, I, this, is, this is not my work. This is my get away from work. So yes, I enjoy it a lot. I'm really glad you're able to get away from work sometimes, Wally, because <laughs> I love this a lot. Hey, I, I have a question for you though. Okay. All right. And I don't know if this is like picking a favorite child, but of the, on this table, do you have a favorite model? And if so, why? I would have to pick the Rocketeer. Uh, this was a, a private commission from a guy in the UK. And it's probably my favorite because I couldn't find any other good Rocketeer models out there in the world. That that's why I went and had somebody draw uh, model me up one. Oh, so this isn't like a, a Thingiverse or My Mini Factory Prusa no. model. This was commissioned, and then you were the one that put it together and finished it. Correct. Uh, the Rocketeer, the Mark II, and the Black Widow are all from. Uh, his name is Simon Walker. He lives in the UK, and uh, he's just he's a great model. Yeah, Simon Walker in the UK does a fantastic job. Awesome. Well, and Wally, so do you. And uh, could we have you tell the audience out there, they're going to want to know more about this because this is incredible. How can they find you? Uh, the best place to find me is on Twitter, uh, at WallyGator7744. Oh, perfect. Wally, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate this. Thanks, Joel. Hey, thanks for making it this far into the episode. You saw some really great interviews with some amazing people at the East Coast Rep Rap Festival. Unfortunately, our current schedule is packed beyond belief. In fact, that's Sean editing the video that you're probably watching right now. And it, we just got back from the airport. We did a trip down to Southern California. We had some amazing stuff. Pay attention to this right here. We didn't have time to finish all of the Earth interviews and the, the rest of the interviews will be out next week. It's gonna be a really cool episode two for the Earth interviews. I can't wait for you to see it, but for now, you're gonna to have to sit tight with this and just uh, keep your fingers crossed that Sean gets it all done. So we'll see you in the next one. Don't forget to hug each other more. We love you all, as always. High five.